Welcome to Take the Lead Radio with Dr. Diane Hamilton, where she interviews some of the most successful leaders, entrepreneurs, authors, speakers, and other individuals who will inspire you to take the lead in your career and personal life. And now, here is Dr. Diane Hamilton. I am here with Dr. Albert Bandura, who is the David Starr Jordan Professor Emeritus of Social Science and Psychology at Stanford University. He is one of the most frequently cited psychologists of all time, along with B.F. Skinner, Sigmund Freud. I mean, you are one of the, the legends. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Welcome, Dr. Bandura. Well, I'm happy to, be, to join you. Well, I have looked forward to this since our last conversation. I feel like I kind of know you a little more, and I, I'm very interested in your work. You're the author of Moral Disengagement, How People Do Harm and Live With Themselves, which I want to talk about that. You're also uh, known very much for doing the uh, Bobo doll experiment. And, uh, so well, yeah, I'm afraid that's going to be my legacy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. You've done some pretty amazing things. I don't know if we could find them. <laughs> So I, I can put it in a, in a larger context. Yeah, well, what do you, you know, I think I want to start because the last time we talked, we kind of got into it later about how you even got to the point to end up at Stanford and got interested in psychology because you came from a, you know, a different um, background. And I, I want to share that with people. Can you just give a little of your background? Well, sure. I think the question you're asking is how does a farm boy from a little town in northern Alberta, uh, end up um, uh, amidst the balmy palms at Stanford. <laughs> That's a huge arc. <laughs> well, and uh, particularly, if I briefly describe my background, my parents migrated from, uh, uh, from Europe, my father from Poland, and my uh, mother from Ukraine. And so they ended up in Halifax, you know, without any resources, uh, no education. And then my uh, father laid the track on the Trans-Canada Railroad, and when he got enough money, he purchased a homestead, which consists of a lot of trees and rocks, and you have to turn that into the farmland. And these folks were the um, uh, pioneers of the Canadian nation, namely... Um, they, there were no homes there, there were no churches, no schools they had to build all this by themselves. And, um, and, and then, in terms of education, um, we had very limited resources. Namely, we had one schoolhouse, which uh, included first grade through high school, and we had three high school teachers. Uh, teaching the entire curriculum, and then I had to take a lot of courses by uh, correspondence. For example, the the French course each Friday morning. I'll turn on the radio and we sang "Sur le pont d'Avignon, tous les monsieurs, tous les monsieurs," and uh, and so. Uh, um, and it was really a, a, a rural, rural community. And uh, uh, so when I was in high school, my mother sat me down and said, uh, Albert, you, you have to decide what you want to do with your life. And I said, yeah, I have a, I have a hockey game in half an hour. <laughs> and I said, this isn't funny to me. So she said, you can stay here and you can till the soil you can play pool, and you can drink yourself to oblivion in the beer parlor, or you might try to get an education. Uh, and given her neutral uh, alternatives, I thought education <laughs> would be the better, better one. <laughs> That's so funny. So your mom had now, a strong impact. And uh, the, uh, the problem was, uh, I had no uh, money to go to, go to uh, college, uh -huh. and uh, and but during the um, high school breaks, um, they said you better go to Edmonton and and you know experience a little broader culture, 
And uh, so I worked in the fashion door company there, and I saved money. And then one day I uh, came home and I said, I found this fantastic job. This is the year, my last year of college. Uh, it's it's in the Yukon, and they they pay very well. I have uh, room and board. Unfortunately, they didn't know wh- wh- where the Yukon was. <laughs> <laughs> this 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 was not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, these are the, you see the. You, uh, the Alcan Highway was built on Muskeg, and, and it uh, it sinks, keeps sinking, oh. and so they have to keep putting gravel on it to maintain the roadbed. And about eighty, about eighty miles, every eighty miles, they have a base camp, in which they're they're responsible for maintaining the road. And uh, and um, so I flew the White Horse, and then got a cab. I mean, a uh, bus to the camp, and when I was there, there was an ambulance there, and they were loading this person on, and I introduced myself and asked whether he had been injured, and they said, oh, hell no, this is our cook. He drank all the lemon extract for the booze, and now we have to go and get his stomach pumped out. <laughs> and so they were really a motley crew. They... Uh, uh, they, um, uh, uh, booze was their chief nutrient. <laughs> and I noticed they were ordering a lot of sugar. Huh. Now, they were, so, they were brewing their own. Uh-huh. And one day, one, and the, the more the mash got, uh, you know, alcoholic, the, the sooner they got up. And they would, and they rushed out one day. This, this is D Day, and then they came back in the probably most profound collective depression in the Yukon. The grizzly bears drank all of their alcoholic mash, and we had drunk grizzly bears, you know, in our uh, in our area, and they were trying to break their break into our food supply but they were too drunk so they would fall over and then I don't think uh, bears got training in how to get up when you're drunk that, so, that would be the most viral video ever now wouldn't it or oh, if I had a video of that because you know the dogs became very brave you know they could grab them by and, they were, and the and the drunk bears would try to turn around and hit them and fall over and the dogs didn't figure out what the hell Adderall is this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you had quite an interesting background that made you uh, a little open to discovering new ideas. And, and I could see how. Oh, yeah. Could... It's really broadened, you know, my perspective on the, uh, on the, uh, <clears throat> Uh, on on the little, on on life because mm-hmm. it was a uh, and so what I was getting is probably the best example of the psychopathology of everyday life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so that do you think that's what drew you into psychology? Was there any other field of study that you considered, or what what led to that? No, no, no. The um, um, see, I got I got a ride. I went. I went to the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. I was picking that primarily for a more benign climate, and uh, and so I was getting a ride with a group of engineers and uh, pre meds, mm-hmm. and these folks take courses at a very early time. I didn't know there was life that early, <laughs> and uh, and so I was sitting in the library and uh, and a student had left a course catalog on the table there and I was flipping through it for a filler so that I could uh, and as I was flipping through this thing psychology looked perfect filler mm-hmm. so I <clears throat> I took it and uh, and uh, 
found my found my profession. Well, I, the, I'd uh, say so. You're the greatest so, uh, so, psychologist of all time right now. Yes, <laughs> by, by flipping, uh, by fortuity, uh-huh. and and so you know, in psychology, we avoid fortuitous determinants because they mess up our prediction models. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so uh, um, <clears throat> so I became, uh, in my theory, I'm really taking fortu- fortuity seriously because it plays a very important role mm-hmm. in our life paths. Mm-hmm. For example, um, I'm at Iowa, um, a graduate student, my uh, friend, um, was late uh, getting to the golf course, so they uh, uh, they um, uh, set us up for a later time, and there were two women ahead of us, and uh, they were slowing up, and we were slow, and we were speeding up, and I met my wife to be in the sand trap. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a cute story. I didn't. So uh-huh. had I had I. Uh, have we, if my, if my friend had come in on time, um, uh, my, my family life would be entirely different. Wow. And, and that had a, uh, an earlier link at the University of British Columbia. Uh, we had to take, uh, two pre, uh, phys ed courses. Mm-hmm. So I took, um, uh, our PE, thinking that we, we would be communing with the muses and so on, mm-hmm. and instead they forced us to run around the track to see <laughs> how out of, out of shape we were. Uh-huh. And after and after I got three quarters of the way through, I decided uh, this could induce a heart attack, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I switched to uh, uh, to. Uh, Archery. Uh, see, there's less movement there. Uh-huh. the The second one was indoor PE, and I thought we'd be dancing to music. And this guy forced us to climb these ropes to dizzy heights, and I made a quick descent, and decided, uh, well, golf would be better <laughs> because what well, was a farm boy? What is a farm boy doing on a golf course? <laughs> oh, well, is this farm boy certainly did some amazing things in every place. And, I mean, I'm, I just I think it's amazing to see what work you've done. And you followed people like uh, Freud. And I think a lot of people probably are curious what you think of his work and how what you did tied in to anything he was working on or how it influenced Yeah, anything. that's mainly historical. I, no one. Uh, there was a... Um, fundamental change in the field of uh, uh, psychotherapy. It was pretty much, uh, uh, clinical psychology was pretty much dominated by, uh, psych- uh, psych- by uh, that was the Freud- Freudian era. It was clear in the, um, in the um, late 50s that that approach lacked predictive value or um, or a therapeutic value, and even even, and in order to you know go through psychoanalysis, you have to be rich and you have to have a lot of free time because they required multiple sessions and so on, and so even even if it were effective, it would have virtually no social utility hmm. because only people with money could afford it. Mm-hmm. And it was in that, uh, that time that uh, within a 10 year period, we really tr- transformed the, uh, the field of um, psychotherapy in favor of cognitive behavior therapy in which it consisted of trying to, uh, try to alter people's faulty thinking and also faulty behavior, and namely, and uh, in addition to that, uh, we focused on determining what is the functional value of this behavior rather than 
assigning people to categories uh, such as you're, you're neurotic, you're this and that, mm-hmm. which o- often stigmatizes the people. Right. And then we got away from uh, talking therapy to, uh, to um, uh, altering faulty thinking, but um, correcting them by um, guided mastery treatment that enabled people to live a better life. And, uh, and so, uh, um, and then we were changing the, the contact, the locus, and the uh, agents of change. In terms of content, we got away from uh, talking therapies designed to, uh, to get people to believe that their behavior is governed by <clears throat> unconscious forces and complexes, and then and then you had the um, uh, the um, defense mechanisms that per- per- presumably hid these motivators from you, and so on. <clears throat> the um, and then in terms of locus, we were doing more of the uh, a lot of the treatment was really trying to alter uh, behavioral styles or the behavioral the styles of behavior, which meant that this required, um, you know, treatment in the, in the context rather than the, just in an office. And with agents, um, this treatment put a lot of emphasis on, on really, um, enabling uh, the large scale of, of people to uh, participate in the treatment. For example, um, you could do treatment, let's say, with a problem child in school, and usually at that time they would be in, in the sandboxes and so on. But <clears throat> if you s- spend, you know, 15 years with a teacher and teach them how to handle problem behavior, you're going to have a different impact um, than if you're treating one kid for 10 hours and so on. And, uh, and then, um, so this is a whole, so within 10 years, we change the uh, mode of treatment. We um, developed a whole new set of journals. We developed uh, conventions and so on. I don't know whether there's any area in psychology in which a change, a transformative change uh, was, uh, was made that, uh, that fast. Wow. Now, we had a, but this treatment was uh, uh, misread by the um, by the press and others um, as uh, as a treatment of social control hmm. and uh, and so um, we had uh, clockwork clockwork orange was depicted as here yeah. they're shocking the person uh, and then uh, Woody Allen had one uh, in which uh, he was he was outwitting these uh, controllers and was treating you like a robot. And then we had the um, uh, the Unabomber who um, sent a bomb to. Uh, a professor in in Michigan who was teaching wow. uh, behavior therapy, and then when we had LaRouche, who you know he was this guy who ran for president all the time, <laughs> and um, uh-huh. and and see he called behavior uh, behavior therapists as Rockefeller Nazis, and he had a tribunal, and he was sentencing <laughs> to, wow. and then. He went to Stony Brook and start, you know, uh, he he started interfering with the classes and so on. So, in the midst of this, 
uh, I began my presidency as the Ameri- for the American Psychological Society, mm-hmm. and uh, and so uh, I decided we can't be passive about this. We really um, have to address this because, as a discipline, we have a res- we have a responsibility to produce good science, but we also should. Ha- have the responsibility of what are the effects of that science. And uh, so I put together a, um, a um, uh, interdisciplinary committee to really examine how these methods were being used, not only individually, but also institutionally in hospitals and in schools. And, uh, and uh, so we produced this fantastic um, um, code, which was actually published as a, as a book. <clears throat> and uh, and um, okay. now what was happening is this mode of therapy, uh, you could see the benefits of it. And, uh, and so before long, we had changed the image from um, social control to a uh, uh, to a treatment that was really more with with uh, self empowerment to be able to lead a better life. And, right. Uh, well, self- so that was that's a so big that was, Yeah, I mean, right now self empowerment is getting even more attention with all the the. Um, you know, uh, people focusing on being meditative and all that. Do you think that your work, uh, what do you think of your work and how it ties into the focus they're starting to go with now with mindfulness? Yeah, well, what's, what happened is mindfulness just hooked on to cognitive <laughs> behavior therapy. I see. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it's, it's not competitive. Right. But, um, uh, but you have to be careful because... Mindfulness is very easy. You sit in your office or you train people to uh, sort of distract themselves, and that, and that could be very helpful. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, But this whole treatment was a treatment of enablement. I see. And, uh, and, you know, I remember uh, I was testing... Uh, um, I decided in testing this theory, um, I would begin with snake phobics, thinking that it would be a circumscribed disorder. Right. But it turned out really uh, deeply affecting people's lives. Uh, the, uh, to get them over the, the phobia case. of whatever. Yeah, uh-huh. for, example, for example, you'll have a member of a family who who couldn't go um, to picnics or outdoor activities and so on. For uh, then you have um, the occupation of uh, firemen and uh, and so on mm-hmm. who couldn't go to the poles, the electrical poles, for 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 fear that uh, the snakes are lurking in the grass and then they're there's one fellow who, in the true spirit of the West, shot himself in the leg oh, no. <laughs> trying to kill a harmless gopher snake. <clears throat> and then, for some who love golf, it was very expensive because <laughs> they often sliced the <laughs> yeah. and They didn't want to go in that grass looking for them. Well, <clears throat> I can relate to that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and um, so they came in, and so I, I was testing a, a guided master treatment mm-hmm. um, that um, uh, people are phobic, um, protect themselves, uh, or they they shun reality, so they can they can never uh, change if they don't uh, re-expose them <clears throat> to reality in the second. Um, they have to confront the problem, and uh, and you need to help them to master it. Well, you know, and, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people study things because they have 
uh, issues or they're interested in it. I mean, did you have any phobias or did you have anything that you were working on that this helped you or did you just find this interesting? I mean, what led to this? Well, it was, um, no, I, I had, uh, I don't have phobias. Um, well, I have phobias with some people I don't necessarily <laughs> want to interact with. <laughs> But that, uh -huh. that's a minor one, <laughs> <laughs> particularly my critics. Uh -huh. But as as being as as going on to ninety four years of age, you see, I've outlived most of my critics. Well, there you go. Which is a which is a good situation. <laughs> yes, for you, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so uh, they come in. And uh, I say, we're going to be going to the next room, and there's a caged snake. Oh. And the first reaction is, this guy's off his medication. <laughs> you, I'm not going close to that room. And I said, well, of course, because if you could, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> and uh, so uh, they said, uh, I'm not going. And I said, well, I, look, I won't ask you to do anything that you couldn't do with a little effort. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'm, I'm not getting close to that door. I said, of course not. You can watch the one way mirror. So what do you, what do you fear? Well, this thing can, can jump on you and, and it could choke you. So I say to the therapist, um, John, would you hang the snake around your neck? <laughs> <laughs> Remind me not to be your therapist after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think the snake was well frightened. <laughs> oh, probably, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so then, by, um, by, um, by these experiences, mm -hmm. they could now get to the door. Right. So and the so it's just big kind of baby steps. The the I don't yeah know, the, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. there there were a number of um, uh, graduated steps, mm -hmm. and so I uh, said, so "You think you go about three inches further? Well, yeah, three inches." Mm -hmm. And I said, "How about six inches?" No, no. So um, so then the next. Graduate modeling is uh, as joint performance with the therapist. Mm -hmm. Would you do it with me? Well, yeah, if you're there. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. So before long, uh, I have him at the uh, cage. And then, you know, uh, they see me um, there, you know, handling the snake and so on. And, uh, and, uh, I said, do you think you can touch it? Well, hell no. And uh, I said, well, I'll give you a, a, a safe uh, a leather glove, and I'll hold it by the head and tail so it can't do anything. And you can just put it over, put it over my hand. And the first thing they say is, it's not slimy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, and it has really. I had a, I used a corn snake. It's really kind of beautiful, you know. And before long, I have them. I hold them by the head, but then I, they work on the tail. And in the four hours, I cured everyone. You know regardless. that is so fascinating because it's about perception, isn't it? I mean, did you study perception? I mean, in the fact that I mean how we look at things uh, how does how does somebody's pers one person's perception of the snake uh differ from somebody else's what what causes this in people yeah but i was m more concerned with altering that perception right that's what i want to do by, how do and by, then, by okay by this guy guided mastery treatment so uh and uh did, did you find any so, factors that were associated with that though what would cause someone to be like that well, they all gave me, I, I, they said, well, first of all, they said, aren't you going to analyze me? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'll do that after we cure you. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, and so they, uh, they had examples in which 
they're going with their father to practice, um, you know, uh, hitting the ball. And they're crossing an area, and the the uh, father spots the um, snake and just in this tremendous uh, violent uh, act, just pounds the snake to death. Ah. Um, and that would another really, that would impact your perception because you're now. Oh, they sure, sure uh-huh. were, uh-huh. yeah. And uh, and then the other was often in films. You know, they would drag out the snakes. You know, coming to the person, and then the music would be there, and they drag it out as much as possible. And so they had nightmares and so on. Just kind and of uh, the so unknown. there are a lot of yeah. lot, a lot of things Mystery. like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. We, yeah. Do you think we make things up to be bigger and worse in our minds? Uh, yeah. Because, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And then, and then, the uh, so the critics. Uh, I remember being invited uh, to Langley Porter Clinic in San Francisco, which was primarily psychoanalytic at the time, and uh, they decided. Well, there's this guy who's boasting that he can, you know, uh, cure snakes in a few hours. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, this is probably the most hostile introduction you can give (laughs) to a guest you invited. So after they uh, got through with the hostile introduction, I said, well, I, I thank you for the generous introduction. It reminds me of a uh, football game when it was, I was at the University of Iowa. Uh, Iowa had just scored against Notre Dame in, in, uh, on their field. And as the player ran out on the field, the, o- the coach turned to the assistant coach and said, there goes a brave fella, a Protestant, attempting a conversion before 50,000 Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I love the, your sense of humor, and I love the stories you, you've been telling, and, and I think that what you've done is just such an, an inspiration, and I just, I, I know that you're, you you liked uh, your last 18 years or so, you've been working on more of the moral disengagement stuff that you wrote about, right, in your book? Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. And so you are very interested in how, you know, what's happening with the planet, and who uh, how we're having global issues and you the last time we spoke you said that we have a problem with the older generations that we we need to look to the younger generations for, for yeah I, uh, there i'm really addressing the uh, most urgent problem facing humankind in this millennium namely um we are um, if you just look at uh, climate change, um, we are uh, polluting uh, the atmosphere with, uh, with uh, carbon and methane gases that are, that are heating our planet. And, um, <clears throat> and um, each year we, um, we have more pumped into the atmosphere and each year we're getting now new records of, uh, of the heat of the planet. And, um, the UN had 20 annual summits to get, to get the countries to, uh, 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 to reduce, uh, their emissions, uh, 20 years of summits that went nowhere. Uh, then, then they um, um, said, well, we're, we're going to do it when we meet in Paris. So they met at Paris, and all they got was promises that they will reduce uh, emissions by a certain percentage, but these were unmeasurable and unenforceable. So, well, uh, after uh, after um, Paris, then they had the one in Poland 
in which they are now fi- and first of all the promises they made uh, would not be sufficient mm-hmm. to reduce global warming and when they met in uh, a year later in Poland they weren't even meeting uh, their their <laughs> promises which were insufficient to begin with and uh, and uh, and then the the countries that are heavily dependent on a on a totally uh, a coal a coal economy decided that they're going to get rid of these pledges altogether, and so they um, uh, in the meantime the planet is getting hotter, and uh, and the other the the other thing that's looming is a horrible concern is that as the planet gets hotter, it begins to thaw the, the macro, the, for example, the, uh, the carbon and methane that have been stored there for millenniums. And once you, once you do that, then you get on a positive feedback loop, namely the more, the hotter it is, the more, uh, the more of these, uh, Heat trapping gases are uh, released, and the more released, the hotter. And this this is out of human control. And uh, and so um, and so I, um, with other colleagues, uh, we've been running long long running serial dramas in in which we're trying to change uh, people's behavior that affects uh, the environment. And uh, there are three areas that we have to address. The first is we got to get off fossil fuels and uh, and uh, and depend on uh, renewables. And uh, we're doing a little better now because because the uh, but we have very little support from governments to. Uh, uh, to give up coal. <clears throat> the second is soaring population growth. It was, uh, our population was, I think, uh, uh, about 3 billion in 1957. Uh-huh. And then <clears throat> this stuff is exponential. Mm-hmm. So now we're heading to uh, 9 to 10 billion. And we've already we've already surpassed the, the planet's uh, carrying capacity. I mean, we need another planet. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's just uh, unbelievable. And so, uh, and so, uh, so we have long running serial dramas. Um, these are not whimsical ones. These are dramas that, um, that we model people's lives uh, the uh, the problems, uh, the uh, impediments they face, mm-hmm. and we inform, guide, and enable them to begin to take the steps to alter their life. So, uh, well, I, I got a question for you about this with global warming being in the news of so many people not believing that there, you know that there is a yeah. problem and all that what's the psychology behind the perception of that i mean wh- why do so many people uh believe something versus so many people don't believe it is the is it media what, what exactly is making people to say there is no global warming versus those who well firmly you see in, in the book on moral disengagement i point out you don't need a theory to explain why bad behavior do do bad things. <laughs> Although most of our research is focused on that. Uh-huh. What we're currently witnessing, a um, pervasive moral paradox in which good people are doing harmful things but still retaining their self-respect, and uh, living in peace with themselves. To what end? Why? Why? Mm-hmm. Because people want cars. <laughs> they want refrigeration. Yeah. They want... Um, For money. 
Okay. The cars should be new ones every year. Right. They. Um, um, so our greed is. Per- our our our, our, our economy, our economy uh, is uh, less so now, but it's built on coal, mm-hmm. and uh, and we we our government uh, invests very very little money on uh, programs to. Um, Prevent this economic, this environmental crisis that we're going to be facing, mm-hmm. and uh, <clears throat> and the uh, so uh, we want a good life, right? So and, n- and green- now what the problem is mm-hmm. the um, um, uh, the poorer countries uh, such as India and uh, and. Um, Africa and South America, they want, they, they want the good Western uh, life as well. Mm-hmm. And so what's happening is, for example, India says that um, 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 they aren't, they said, we, we want to increase the, the, um, the standard of living of our, of our people. They said, well, we have millions of people who don't have electricity. And so we don't we don't make any pledge that we're going to re- reduce carbon emissions. In fact, we are going to be increasing carbon emissions. And um, well, and what do you um, think of the work of somebody like Elon Musk that's doing the electric and uh, cars and the d- different things to try and come up with different means? Yeah. Of- well, if if we can develop uh, electric cars, they're going to be cheap enough for people to buy them uh then that's that's an important way of uh of reducing our dependence on uh on gasoline mm-hmm. well and, and what, what led to your interest in this i mean you're obviously a curious guy what do you think made you so curious about all these different aspects of you know first of all you know the psychological aspects of modeling and all that work that you've done there but and then now this you, you said well you see you see my work um, um, sort of may look to the observer as just different programs from search I have it on modeling I have it on goal setting I have research on uh, on self-efficacy and um, but these are all uh, aspects of my theory of uh, human agency that um, um, according to this theory, um, people have a hand in influencing the events that affect their lives and in uh, shaping their lives uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a favorable direction. Mm-hmm. And then um, the, um, the features of, of uh, agency, the first one is forethought. Right. And this is, we, um, um, we uh, select goals to, uh, to influence our motivation and behavior, and we have outcome expectations as to what effects are, are these behaviors going to be involved. Right. The second is you uh, you now adopt standards of behavior, and um, and you respond either positive or negatively as to well, how well you adhere to them. And so this second uh, feature of agency is self-regulation, and then the third is self-reflection, namely you reflect on your behavior, and then you judge it and make whatever changes need to be made. And self-reflection, the major factor in self-reflection is self-efficacy. Right. You reflect on your, on your capabilities, and this, and this uh, influ- influences your behavior. So I, had this, so I had this huge program research and modeling because when I was a graduate student, you know, 
Um, that was during the uh, uh, the period of, uh, of behaviorism, mm -hmm. and you see, and um, and that suggests that the way in which you learn and change is determined by consequences. Um, and um, see, all our traditional theories were heavily influenced. There are two ways of of uh, learn learning, one is by experience, mm -hmm. and the second is by modeling. Um, now, during the behaviorism period, uh, these folks didn't want to touch modeling at all because <laughs> uh, because they assume that behavior is shaped by consequences. So, how in the hell can you learn? Sitting there looking, you aren't producing any responses. You aren't getting any reinforcement for them. Uh -huh. What the hell? So what they? So I had to fight with them about. Uh, oh, it's just monkey see, monkey do. So I showed. Oh no, no, no. Uh, uh, modeling is the mother of invention. So uh, well, if you that's if you want if you want to produce uh, Alexis. Just, 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 just get a a a, a better car, and then uh, so that uh, you draw on on, on, uh -huh. on other sources of information. Uh -huh. And then another one was um, so I was demonstrating there are two ways in which modeling increases innovation. One. If you're around models that are innovating, you're you're a more innovative person than, than right. if they aren't. Uh -huh. Secondly, uh, um, modeling and creativity, you're often building on um, on uh, the progress already made by others. For right. example, not reinventing the wheel. Jo Jobs did not invent uh, the computer. Right. Nor, nor did they, nor did Jobs invent the internet. But what you do is you put together uh, things that already are made, and you you do something that's even better. <clears throat> right, and and that's sorry. and then and then the uh, the other one was uh, well, you're just modeling the endpoint, the behavior, but you aren't modeling the cognitive processes. Mm. I said like hell. <laughs> uh, we did we did research in which. The models just um, uh, speak aloud of what <laughs> what their cognitive processes are, right. and so on. Well, so anyway, I, I, you know, I got a question for you about this forethought and modeling and, uh, and all the things you were just saying. Now, where does curiosity fall into that mix? I mean, do, do you need curiosity to spark the motivation and the forethought? And it, is that the beginning? Well, the curiosity would be at the motivational level. What mm -hmm. what moves you? Mm -hmm. Right, and I to, just wondered um, if you thought curiosity came before or after motivation, because uh, I, I was no, just... no. It's curiosity is really um, it, it. It would be a, uh, a source of motivation. Right, you know? right. So it would be the, get, like the spark. You get to curious. Motivation. Right. You get curious. You better <laughs> better start. <laughs> <laughs> examining a lot of things. <clears throat> well, I, I, okay, so we've talked about your work, and I'm curious, I, so many people have interviewed you, and you said a funny thing the last time we talked, I, I don't know if you want to share it again, but you said people call you that they're writing books and uh, want your input, who maybe weren't aware of your work, and I find that very hard to believe. Um, does that happen often? No, 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 I, I can prove that easily. <laughs> <laughs> You say Bandura, they Bobo doll. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> At most. Yeah. I said, I don't know who this guy is. I can't <clears throat> believe that. Well, well, tomorrow I'm having a, um, a uh, reporter from Washington Post coming, and he's writing a book on uh, suicide. Oh. And um, <clears throat> there was interesting, there was another reporter who was writing a book, I forget on what topic, and he said, you know, I discovered you by accident. He said, why the hell don't people know about your work? <laughs> I can't imagine. And, uh, and, uh, and, the same, and the same of the person who's coming tomorrow. Uh 
Uh-huh. He said, you know, I was going around asking people, you know, I, he was interviewing them on their, on their theories and treatments of suicide. And uh, a couple of them were saying, well, you should, you should really go and talk to Bandura. He wrote the, he wrote the Bible of prayer modification. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just shows you that people need to read a little bit more. I can't even imagine. So uh, it was interesting. Yeah, the earlier one said, uh, you know, you're doing this fascinating stuff. You're addressing really major problems. And uh, I'm going to make sure you're going to get known. <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and and Diane, you see, you're helping. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely. I need. I need, I need more Diane. <laughs> well, I, I I may have to quote you on that. But <laughs> 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 is there anything that you haven't shared that people don't know about you that would be a fascinating thing? I mean, now what you said you're gonna be 94 this year, right? So yeah. So now that you're 94, is there any story, any quick? thing you want to share that you haven't shared in any other interview that I can scoop to say I oh, yeah. got this from yeah. Albert Ventura. Yeah. Okay. What is yeah. It? Um, I get a lot of emails from high school students mm-hmm. who are taking, uh, you know, advanced psychology. And I answer them all in CE. Wow. And, uh, and um, so I get this one, Professor Bandura. We're having a big argument in our, in our class, and only, only you can resolve it. Professor Bandura, are you still living? <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, I, would write back I no. said, we have email on the other side, but not Facebook. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. That is great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's, that has to, to be uh, quite entertaining to see the, what people write to you and all that uh, that you found. But you're oh, like... that's, that's, that's been really amazing. Uh, see, I receive a lot of letters from people who say, <clears throat> I gave up, <clears throat> I see no future, oh. I have no hope. And then I start reading your stuff on self-efficacy. And now I want to tell you what my achievements are. Wow. And, uh, and that's, really, uh, that's really fascinating. That has to just be the best feeling in the world. And, you know, your life has been just one amazing achievement. It, what does it feel like to, when you are the most frequently cited psychologist of all time? You're one of those, and you're also the greatest living psychologist. Mm-hmm. What does does that blow your mind, or is it you're just at this point you've heard? No, so I, I treat those as beauty contests. <laughs> and yeah. also, you know, I get a lot of honorary degrees. I think about twenty of them 20. You know, from different universities. Wow, and. Uh, the first one was from my alma mater. See, I, I, uh, uh, so I call home, and uh, my mother answered the phone, and I explained to her, you know, I have I have a honorary degree from the university, and there's a long pause, and then she says, "What in the hell program you're taking that it took you 15 years to get it?" <laughs> Your mother cracks me up. That is so funny. I said, well, Mom, this is kind of a different one. It's a little different. A little different. Um, a little different. It sounds like your mother yeah. had a big impact on your curiosity and your sense of needing, you know, to have an education and all that. Do you think she was your Well, that was, that was interesting because, you see, in the small town, I think about 90% of the uh, youngsters, uh, the males, would... Uh, would uh, become farmers mm-hmm. and uh, and the principal of the school called my parents in and he said uh, you know I get this test called the uh, IQ test and uh, she said I don't think I don't think Albert should be a farmer mm-hmm. I-, I think he should go to college and, uh, Based on your IQ test that you took? Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Do you remember your result? And, and, <laughs> and my parents said, yeah, but we don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. 
<laughs> she says, you will find money, but you have to uh, make the decision that he isn't going to be a farmer and that he should go to college. And uh, That's awesome. And so that was uh, another impetus. And uh, well, my father, my parents didn't have a... Um, any education, but they put a tremendous emphasis on uh, uh, on really self development through education. And uh, well, are you planning and, on getting any future degrees <laughs> now that you're almost ninety four on future development? Well, you see, um, I, I I had to quit long distance travel. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, we have so online gotten, education now. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but I um, um, so you know you have to go there for the ceremonies and uh -huh. so on. Yeah, and uh, but I did uh -huh. get a um, uh, a uh, um, an email from a uh, uh, from a university in France in which they want to give me an honorary degree and uh -huh. I. I I, I thanked him and said, but, you know, I've had to give up uh, foreign travel. So they're saying they're trying to figure out how to um, um, give me a degree in absentia. So. Oh, well, you know, I mean, your work, it, it deserves so much recognition. And it was so nice of you to be on the show and to share these stories. And I can see why you've earned so many honorary doctorates. You're, you're, uh, name is legendary and it was i love talking to you last time it was so much fun this time thank you so much for doing the show hey if somebody wants to um find out more about getting your book moral disengagement or just finding out about you in general wh where do you like people to to go do you have a website or uh do you want them to go to amazon or is there something you want to share no they they could send me uh, i have a uh, a new website oh, yeah? which is fantastic awesome. because um it includes um, all um, a, a listing of papers and articles uh, for each of my 14 or 15 areas of research. And it's, it's scheduled so that, first of all, there's a description of the area, and then you have a list of um, sort of general papers on the phenomena, and then a list of major uh, articles, wow. and then wow. uh, and then videos or books uh, connected uh, with that particular area, and um, What's and then I have wow. we have the the uh, you know the one of all the honors, and then I have a separate one for all of the uh, honorary degrees. And I have the photos, so I look you pretty ran strange. Out of bandwidth with all that. <laughs> That's a lot Some of information. Some of these are pretty strange. <laughs> my my mentor at Iowa got a honor degree from uh, from uh, La, uh, La Sapienza in Rome, huh. and and he sent me a photograph. He said, "There, you get a bib." So Al, you're gonna <laughs> you're you're gonna have a bib. There you go. Maybe that be your that'll be your bib. That'll be great. I love that. Well, what is the website yeah, if anybody then, wants to go to? And it? Then I have others which are. I even have a uh, have a short on the uh, on the uh, phobia therapy. Uh -huh. And uh, and then I have uh, uh, I have a very long. Uh, uh, papers on uh, on the global applications, and I'm I'm just revising another one, which is I really had fun doing it. Oh yeah. Um, the um, um, the uh, Lynn Sherry had taken videos of these kids who uh, made fantastic. Uh, environmental changes and these are nine-year-olds and ten-year-olds and ten-year-olds and uh, and uh, I looked at them and intuitively 
they were using most of the principles from, from social cognitive theory. Wow. And, and, uh, and these are really dramatic. I mean, uh, you have a uh, nine-year-old. Hmm? Was that the kid in Germany? Yeah, nine, nine-year-old German kid oh, mm-hmm. who, who, who went on the internet and saw uh, the uh, story on the uh, woman in Africa who planted millions of trees. And uh, so he decided he's going to start a refor- refor- t- reforestation program in which he got a, about 800,000 trees planted in, uh, in Germany. And then he put this program on the Internet, and there are thousands, millions of them being planted elsewhere. This is a nine-year-old. There's another th- uh, three nine-year-olds. Wow. And uh, wow. and they saw they saw some of these uh, uh, films that uh, that Lynn has, and and here they were they were working on assumed similarity in modeling. So these kids say um, these kids are no different from from me from us. Right. And if they can do it, why can't we do it, you see? Yeah. So, so the first thing uh, in uh, Lexington, the first thing they do is they go to the town council to try to get them to remove an ordinance that says um, you, can't put, uh, you can't put the panels on public buildings. And so they go there and, and the... Uh, Council votes unanimously to uh, remove it. And then the city goes on to put uh, the, uh, the panels on all of their public buildings. And then they say, well, if we can do that, why, don't, why, why shouldn't we have panels in our school? Right. And, uh, and then they, in terms of efficacy buildings, she said, we're no, we're no, we're no longer any girlies. We have power. <laughs> and then, so then they hear that they were going to cut down some forest trees right back of their homes where they play often. Oh. So they got a petition, and, um, and they stopped the city from doing that. And, uh, and they say, this is just the beginning. <clears throat> and uh, then... Uh, there's another one in which they got uh, um, one of the cities in, uh, near L.A. where they got they got uh, plastic bags banned. Wow! There's another one. There's another one who is uh, their 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 area. All the kids really have breathing problems. Some even require medication. And so she said, you know, I wondered why we have all these, you know, we have the, uh, we have the coal-fired plant here, and we have the water clarification plant here, and we have the whole garbage dump here. Uh, this looks to me like environmental <laughs> right. <Like> racism. <clears throat> and so she mounts a campaign and gets the damn um, coal fire plant uh, um, shut down. Yeah. Well, it is. And, and so what I, what I do in this paper, I start out with the failure of the adults to make any changes. Mm-hmm. And the fact, and they say we can no longer um, rely on adults. Uh, that um, and if we're gonna if we're gonna have a, a future, uh, we're gonna have to create it. And not now. It's it is not the future. The future is right now. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> and they um, and that's when they begin to uh, uh, to do these things. Then from there, I go on to a summary of the. Uh, the youth uh, gun movement. Uh, these kids said, we've had enough. 
they uh, had Florida adopt four laws. They um, um, they um, set up the uh, march for our lives in Washington. They had half a million and about a million on the internet. <clears throat> they uh, then set up the uh, their uh, caravan where it, they were crisscrossing uh, the, the country, um, signing up uh, youngsters to vote and so on. So I use that as an example of a youth. And so what I then turn to is argue for the development of a youth environmental movement. And you can imagine if you could mobilize all the youth of our nation and the youth around the world, right. what fantastic power you have where the adults are a complete failure. <clears throat> well, I, 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 your mind it, it is uh, so impressive of the things you continue to work on and you, you take such, you, the scope of the things you take on. <laughs> it's a, so impressive. And and I think this is going to be interesting to so many people. And I, I, I didn't get a chance to get the name of that website that you created. Do you know the name of your website uh, or is it still being created? I'll, I'll be, well, no, it's already created, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll send it to you. Okay, great. I'll make sure it's linked. And then we'll see the scope, you know, mm -hmm. I, um, um, you know, I was asked to review a, uh, an article on a modeling in, in spirituality and so on. Wow, and, uh, that would be interesting and, too. And uh, so now people think I'm an authority on spirituality, and, uh, I cite the case there. The issue does uh, does religiosity affect self efficacy? You know, it, you know ah. God is going to set it up. Um, and so I cite the example. The there was a uh, the story, uh, not true, but uh, the the dam breaks and. Uh, this small town is being flooded, and uh, a, a guy on uh, uh, goes by and says, "Come on, jump on my uh, uh, on my thing here." And he said, "No, I want to put my faith in the uh, in the Lord." Um, and then a motorcycle. Uh, then he's now on uh, on the window sills and a. Uh, the motorboat comes by and says, come on, um, jump on. And he says, no, I put my faith in the Lord. And then finally he's on the roof and the, and the uh, helicopter sends down the rope. And he says, no, go away and put him in. So he wakes up at the pearly gates and he says, why didn't you help me? And And, and God says, I sent you a, um, I sent you a boat. I sent you a a, uh, <clears throat> a helicopter. I sent you something else. What more do you want? <laughs> 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 right. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that don't see the signs, I'll tell you. And I can imagine that your work has been so helpful for so many people. And that's got to be a great legacy. And it was so nice of you to, to share your story on the show today. Uh, thank you so much. Well, I, I have one more. If, oh, if sure. You still Go this. ahead. This is when I got the uh, National Medal of Science. Uh, uh, I get an email from the uh, White House saying that, uh, you know, I've been elected for the uh, National Medal of Science, uh, but they need my Social Security number. <laughs> well, I have a policy. I don't give my Social Security number on the Internet. So I concluded this was a fraud. And uh, I get another one that's really urgent. They said, you know, we have to do the security check on you in order for you to get into the White House. And, um, and so I called my daughter and I said, could you call them? I think now they want my uh, 
uh, you know, my bank number. So she calls and he says, no, dad, uh, this is real. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to give it to him. Yeah, that is that is so funny. Oh, well, you you just you're so you're a really fun guy to talk to. I had so much fun the last time we chatted. And well, uh, I had fun in the interview. Oh, thank uh, you. This yeah, so I thank you. And, and uh, you are I'll welcome. send you if if the public had the the email, they could see such a uh, the scope and also for the website. Would, yeah. That would be great. It, it could really affect their lives. Yeah, mm. I'm sure it will. Yeah. And I'm going to definitely share it. We'll put it at the uh, bottom of the transcribed uh, information at drdianehamilton.com forward slash blog, people who were listening. And we'll make sure that uh, you're able to access everything from the incredible Albert Bandura. Thank you.